What exactly is conscious parenting? Then they get fear, they get shame, they get guilt, they get control, they get punishment. How delusional that is and how destructive that is. Why do we attach to the belief systems that we do? But in meditation, you learn how that is all an illusion. Why we as parents need to move away from outcome goals to process goals. We should welcome all emotions, all feelings. You have to learn to accept your ordinariness and your limitations. So could you please share some specific instance where we personally help you overcome a challenging situation? Your thoughts are not yours. They don't have the experience, they don't have the self-worth to manage their emotions. Fundamentalist, religious cult leader now. So you started it. I didn't say anything. There's no chanting, there's no idol, there's no God, there's no religion, there's no leader. They have such an attitude and they tell you all your bullshit, right? They call you on your bullshit. Dr. Shafali, how in the world are we supposed to discipline our children then? Should we just let them do whatever their hearts desire? Can you talk more about why traditional parental discipline is an absolute no-no and a little bit more about what parents should do instead? Pursuing anything. We're not waiting for anything. So nothing is amazing anymore. It looks like everything around us is truly designed to now give us instant gratification. Now, it doesn't take a lot of energy to do it crappily because you can just put them in front of the screen. At what age should I allow or give my child a smartphone? And you stated at the very minimum. Oh, I think of it as a loaded gun. Our parents gave up nearly everything they knew and left everyone that they were familiar with to pursue a better life for us, their children. Because it is about changing our future. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features in-depth interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Whether you're seeking inspiration or motivation, or simply looking to learn something new, the Avenue of the Strongest has something for everyone. Now, certainly today, get ready to be inspired. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming the one and only Dr. Shafali to the show. Dr. Shafali is a clinical psychologist, parenting expert, and a three times New York Times best-selling author. Dr. Shafali received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University and specializes in the integration of Western psychology with Eastern philosophies. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shafali. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to speak to your audience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's go ahead and get started right now. So you play a pivotal role in popular, uh, popularizing the concept of conscious parenting. Your groundbreaking work in this area has garnered international recognition with high profile individuals like Oprah, of course, endorsing your revolutionary parenting approach. Now, first of all, let me apologize in advance because I know this is the number one question you get asked all the time at the start, but it really sets the framework. So first question, what exactly is conscious parenting? So conscious parenting is a brand new, it's only been around since I wrote my first book way of parenting our children that is drastically like fundamentally different than the traditional parenting model that you and I were raised in. The traditional parenting model puts the parent in the superior dominant position where they give the parent full control and the mandate of that parent is to fix the kid, create the perfect kid, the happy kid, the successful kid, the extroverted kid, the cheerful kid, and the parent in that model is given this mandate and this burden and this responsibility, but also the delusion that they can actually create this magical supersonic creature who's a little bit of Julia Roberts, a little bit of Michael Phelps, a little bit of the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, Einstein, right? It really pumps the ego of that parent to say, here, you have supreme control, do what you want, fix this kid and make it a museum art piece. Conscious parenting realizes how ego-filled that is, how delusional that is, and how destructive that is. And that's why, you know, as a clinician, psychologist that I am, I work with adults and I see the ravages of that kind of upbringing where children are pitted into the parents' movie, into their mm -hmm. fantasy. And if they don't meet the fantasy, 
then they get fear, they get shame, they get guilt, they get control, they get punishment. There's a whole new way to parent. In conscious parenting, it is about parenting yourself. The parent has to parent themselves because when we parent ourselves, what that means is we're healing ourselves, we're coming whole, and we're not going to use this child as an object of our fantasy. The child is not here to give us medals, to give us significance, to give us worth, and to give us success. The child is here to live out its own mandate. And our goal as a conscious parent is to give the baton to the child. Here, you have to live your own mandate. It doesn't mean you don't have influence. You have a lot of influence, but the influence is not through control. The influence is through connection. That's incredible. And wow, what a great insight. And we're going to talk more about conscious parenting. But before we go ahead and get into that, I kind of want to take you back to 1993 when you moved from, from Mumbai, India to San Francisco at the age of 21 to go study. Now, we all know, everyone knows you for being a rock star clinical psychologist, the New York Times bestselling author. But I want to get to know more about your personal journey a little bit more. What was it like when you were just 21 years old moving to San Francisco? Did you know from that age you wanted to pursue clinical psychology? I did. I did know. I was, you know, not everyone knows what they want to do when they're young. And actually, you're not supposed to know what you want to do till you hit your middle to late 20s. So I was just a little bit of a unicorn in that way. But I don't don't endorse it for everyone. It just happened to work for me. So I happened to know early that I wanted to always be in service and teach children, much like what you're doing, what I'm doing, a combination but I left India because I was on a quest. And from a young age, again, I had this wanderlust to go and explore the world. And as soon as I came to America, I began studying Vipassana meditation. I began getting into self-growth, psychology. I did a master's in psychology. So I was always interested in growing mm -hmm. and understanding this thing called being a human, what is this journey all about, observing people, you know, a little bit of an anthropological interest in humanity. Why do we attach to the belief systems that we do? How did these belief systems come into play? How do they impact our lives? Like these questions were my burning curiosity mm -hmm. and they've continued to be that. Plus I began meditating, which gives you a whole different vantage into what it means to be alive mm -hmm. and in the western world or the industrialized way of thinking it's all about external power external success external identification but in meditation you learn how that is all an illusion and that is actually the cause of your suffering so i was able to juxtapose that in my work with clinicians and then i did a phd so I've just been on this growth curve to keep evolving and understand myself better through relationships, through parenthood, through my clients. And that's why I keep writing books. Writing is my passion, like someone else could say painting or cooking. So it's just my passion. And that's how I express what I learn. Um, so that's just my main focus is how can we suffer less? Why are we suffering so much? And it really goes down to the parent, right? The, yeah. the parent mind is the child's destiny. And so if you change the evolution of the parent, you change the children, then you change the future. Right. That's, that's an incredible story. <clears throat> I, ho I hope everyone who is listening right now or watching, they will be inspired and empowered by your story <laughs> and will start pushing themselves, you know, to start their own journey. Um, let's dive right into your new book. Uh, the Parenting Map, Step-by-Step -step Solutions to Consciously Create the Ultimate Parent-Child Relationship. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me an early access to read this. Uh, it was a great help to me as the father of two beautiful daughters. Uh, now, let's imagine uh, if we walk down the street right now and ask a parent what their greatest wish for their children is. I think it would be most likely something like, I just want my child to be happy and successful. So why is this such a bad statement to make as a parent? Can you talk about why we as parents need to move away from outcome goals to process goals? Oh, beautiful. So every parent I ask, they, they say, oh, I just want my kid to be happy. 
So let's take that one first and then we'll take the success. Yeah. But you know the way they say it is you know like as if that's like the basic i'm all i'm asking is my kid to be happy but what we don't realize when we want our kids to be happy is that we are wanting an outcome of happiness so when you take your kid to disney world and they're miserable the whole time they're there which is most kids under the age of 6 they're tired they're hungry they're hot we take it very personally When our kid doesn't get invited to the popular kid's birthday party and they're sad, we take it very personally because our attachment is on their happiness, but really because that makes us feel good, because that makes us feel like we are winning at this parenting and it makes us feel like good, like that's my reward. Now, I'm not saying that you should wish your kids to be unhappy. All I'm saying is don't wish. Like you have no right to wish for the outcome of your kids experience it's like we want to control their mood you know so then we say to the kid you know after all i've done for you you're still unhappy right because right, yeah. we're so wanting the payoff and the reason we are attached to happiness is because unhappiness makes us uncomfortable and in our own childhood we were denied all our feelings right So in one of Rumi's poems uh I think it's called The Guest House we should welcome all emotions all feelings but culture has made us so happy hungry that when we're not it's a problem and you see that in today's culture people cannot tolerate not being perfectly happy yeah. and if the Uber eats doesn't come on time or if your your partner is not perfect oh we're going to cancel everything so this comes from the intolerance of the human experience human experience is what it is and you cannot control your children and if you control your children to only be happy you're actually creating more unhappiness because you're teaching them to be anxious about anxiety right you're teaching them to be anxious when they're unhappy so now they're going to be driving for unha- for happiness so they're going to go to have alcohol or the drug or the fancy car or the relationship because they cannot tolerate you know what life is ordinary life is messy life is full of rejection you will not be invited to every party or every game or every table but who says you need to be invited to every party you cannot everyone cannot be the superstar everyone cannot be the nobel peace prize winner you have to learn to accept your ordinariness and your limitations so that's a huge paradigm shift but it changes the way you live your life it changes your way you expect your children to be something other than they are it's a paradigm shift and the same with success you know success is really it's just it's the four letter word please be rich right just be rich that's what success is and that's so rigid and so linear and so narrow that you minimize all sorts of life all sorts of ways of being and you set yourself up as a parent you know and then you're driving your child to get into that elite college and the elite alumni and the elite group because you imagine that that is going to be the road map to joy and it never is and every successful person will tell you that success does not bring joy it just brings success that's all yeah yeah that's um uh, yeah that's an incredible answer thank you <laughs> Um next question actually you already covered a little bit but anyway let's a little bit also dive deep into it so when i was doing research and preparing for this interview something particularly caught my my attention is that you engage in the practice of vipassana as you have mentioned earlier so could you please share some specific an instance where vipassana helped you overcome a challenging situation and how your self awareness has developed since then uh since you start practicing it and for those who are really not familiar what it is just um tell a little bit about what vipassana is well i'm going to sound like a, a fundamentalist a religious cult leader now so <laughs> you started it i didn't say anything so to me uh vipassana meditation is hands down the best thing i did in my life it is a practice it's not a religion it's not a philosophical belief system in fact it is about not having beliefs right so yeah. it is a practice a practice of entering the present moment and 
I use Vipassana principles every day, every hour of my life. Hands down, I, it has changed my life. I look at the world through the principles of Vipassana. So what are the principles of Vipassana? First, it's a meditation practice to focus on the breath. There's no chanting. There's no idol. There's no God. There's no religion. There's no leader. It's a practice. And just that focus on the breath is the most elegant practice ever. I'll tell you why. Because the breath is not artificial. It's not external. It's yours. You, it's portable. It's internal. It is the mediator between the external world and the internal world. You cannot live without this mediator. It's in the present moment. It's impermanent. It's changing every moment. It takes you deep into your awareness of your aliveness. It is whole. There is no good breath or bad breath. You just want to breathe. So there's no judgment. So right there, it teaches you everything you need to know about life. Life is impermanent. Life is neither good nor bad. It just is. Life is every breath at a time. It's changing every moment. It is about going inward and living in this world, but always coming back inward. It is about intense presence. It is about being alive to the gratitude of your wholeness right now. It just is. And every time we think negatively, quote unquote negatively, the breath will change, which means you are a co-creator of your reality. So when you begin to observe your breath and observe your thoughts and see how your thoughts affect your breath, you go, oh my goodness, I'm creating my reality right now. My, my experience of reality. So your breath is neutral and until you begin to think negatively. The greatest teaching of meditation is that your thoughts are not yours. Your thoughts are a amalgam of your inheritance, your culture, your what you just read in the magazine or the newspaper. Thoughts come and go. You can choose your thoughts if you learn to regulate your breath, if you learn to come into the present moment. But if you don't learn this technique, your thoughts will, they, they are in charge. And thoughts are monkeys, you know, all the monkeys are in charge. So, and I love the monkeys, but they can cause a lot of destruction. So you want to tame your thoughts. And the only way to tame it is to observe them. And so Vipassana is a way to observe, to become aware, to come into the present moment. It's hands down, hands down, the best technique of living in the world, according to me. <laughs> I've been I've been actually practicing um, meditation, uh, six phase meditation by vision. So it co it also can be called uh, vipassana, or it's something different. Well, that is a little bit different because it's directed. No, each phase is a different. You have mm. to think about your gratitude. So this one, you should think... stay with your own thoughts. This one is you just observe your thoughts, which means you are hardcore watching your monkeys, watching your madness. You're not, you're not bypassing by, you know, thinking of a chant or even though that's very useful, right? Vision will kill me. Yeah. I know him well. That is very useful. Buy Vision's book, please. But this is about, this is hard really hardcore. It's naked, brutal, observe your thoughts, which means you are in touch with how your mind is activated, how you think, what your patterns are. And that's what I teach in this book, The Parenting Map, for the parent to begin to observe their patterns. Um, and it's, it's amazing how much junk is in our thoughts and how much ego is in our parenting. So if you're not going to be aware of that, you won't go to the core of your illness, of your disease. I see. So everyone who is watching us right now, go ahead and start meditating right now to improve yes. your mental health, to improve your kids' mental health because of your mental health. <laughs> and I teach, I have courses, I teach Vipassana meditation, I have courses, but I've also done over 200 for free on YouTube so they can go and get it for free. We will definitely have it in our um, comments down below, the link to your free course. Okay, um, let's move and talk about the teenage rebellion. <laughs> As a father, 
I sometimes lose my sleep nervous about what is to come when my children will be uh, teenagers. We have so many dreaded stories from parents about their teens. And in your book, you talk about why teenage rebellion is everywhere. It's because our kids are fatigued by uh, their parents' gut complexes and burn out from being compliant and uh, obedient. Um, most parents don't actually even realize that teenage rebellion is a part of social development in order for them to develop and identify independent, uh, independence from their parents. So what can parents do to take uh, an immediate action and to do make this process easier? Well, they need to stop thinking of teenagers as bad and be scared of them like you are, you are being. Because the reason why teenagers are scary to parents is because you really are losing control. Not only are you losing control, they have such an attitude and they tell you all your bullshit, right? They call you on your bullshit. Once they become teenagers, you cannot hide anymore. They are going to catch you and they're going to find your hypocrisy. And they, if you raise them with empowerment, they're going to tell you about it. So that's why we don't like them because they're so annoying. They look right through you. But if you can look at that as a teaching, like, wow, I want to learn. I want someone to call me on my bullshit. I want to examine myself. I'm so proud of my kids because they can see through the bullshit. I'm so proud of my kids because they are separating from me. That's healthy. It's healthy. They must separate. When, when parents tell me that, oh, my teenager is an angel, they are, they are so good. I go, uh-huh, wait, wait. Your, your teenager is just delayed. It is human <laughs> nature. It's human nature to want to separate, to individuate, not to lose connection, but to find yeah. themselves. And therefore, defiance in your teenage years is better than in their 20s because then they may just, because they're not in your house then. Yeah. At least when they're doing it in front of you, you can still stay physically and emotionally connected more than if they left the house. So if you can, as a parent, enjoy the rebellion and understand it's normal, it's healthy, it's necessary, it's effective, it's pivotal, then you're not threatened by it. And then you're not reacting to it. You are, you're laughing inwardly like, oh, here it comes. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times my daughter slammed the door. I mean, literally off the hinge when she was a teenager because she had to show her, you know, her attitude. She had to show that yeah. she's the boss. And I realized, oh, why does my kid need to show it so much? Must be because I'm being extra bossy. Maybe if I backed off, my kid wouldn't feel the need to yell and scream at me. So I learned from that. And the more I backed off and just went back a little bit energetically and gave them space and negotiated with her and partnered with her rather than bossed over her, we had a much better relationship. Wow. So if at the beginning, at the beginning, if we would be more bossy, this bossiness will uh, show up more during the rebellion, correct? Yes, so be careful. The more you control them, then the more controlling you are, then 100% they're going to try to break free. The very quote unquote good children, they don't break free, they break in, like they break down. So mm -hmm. you do, control is never the right way to go. The way to go is what I say in my book, we're talking about my book, The Parenting Map. It's all about a new way to get control, not through control, but through influence. And influence is through connection. So Dr. Shafai, this is, this is a great point. So let, I want to transition to something because in your book, you strongly believe that traditional parental discipline is basically fear mongering and bullying. And as I was reading your book, I immediately 100% agree with you. I don't have kids yet. So I imagine as a parent, you still have to really fight your way through to go ahead and become a, a more conscious parent. But you go on to state that the current paradigm around parental discipline is extremely toxic, unconscious, and dare I say, criminal at times. Now for everyone watching, you know, they're probably thinking, Dr. Shafali, how in the world are we supposed to discipline our children then? Should we just let them do whatever their hearts desire? Now, I'm not going to reveal all the secrets because in your book, you offer an incredible solution, which is connecting before correcting. And you break it down beautifully into three pillars that parents can follow. 
Can you talk more about why traditional parental discipline is an absolute no-no and a little bit more about what parents should do instead? Yeah, so parents, of course, will resist this idea because we've been raised with that. So we think it's either full on control, we get to do whatever we want, or the kids are going to be drug dealers and criminals, right? We, right. we cannot see the middle way because we were not raised with the middle way. So the pillars of connection before correction help you to enter into a deep bond with your children where your children don't see you as the ultimate ty tyrant and authority figure. Therefore, they're not fighting and rebelling against you. Therefore, they're more open to listening to you. And therefore, there's less conflict in the house because you're not the boss of them. So they can talk to you and then you're like, oh, okay. So if you tell them to turn off the TV or the get off the video game and they're like, no, you're like, okay, you want, you, you have to talk to me about this. So you can turn the TV off and go, I want you to turn it off. You don't want to turn it off. We have to both win over here. We both need to win. So let's come up with a strategy. Otherwise, I have to take the remote away. I don't want to take it away. Mm -hmm. So can you and I come up with a strategy? And if they say, you know, okay, 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 okay. You know, five more minutes or 15 more minutes. You make them write it down and sign, you know, and you take some collateral. You're like, okay, I'm taking this, your favorite teddy bear till you agree. You know, you right. can make it a game about negotiation and partnership and connection and a, a, a mutual understanding, you know, create a memorandum of understanding over and over and over again so that you and your kid know mm -hmm. that there has to be a proposal and there has to be winning on both ends. Mm -hmm. So now my daughter's in her 20s and she comes to me, you know, and she'll say, okay, I have a proposal for you, right? She knows it's, that's how we talk. Yeah. And when you're, and she says, when you're in a good mood, let's talk about it. And then she'll yeah. negotiate, you know, she'll negotiate how many friends can come over, how late they can stay up, how much alcohol or not alcohol, like everything is negotiated. And, and she gets some, she gets some credit and I get some credit. And then we both lose a little bit too. Right. But if you, if you build this in that it's a conversation, then the kid is not rebelling, sneaking, hiding, lying. She just needs, they just need to know that they need to present a good case and you need to present a good case and you teach them that things can be negotiated. So it doesn't have to rise up to, I'm going to punish you because you're a bad, evil person. Right. Now that's, that's incredible. And since we're talking about parental discipline, I want to make, bring up another really important topic, which is, uh, which is on everyone's mind right now. So anxiety and depression among our children have reached alarming levels. Our recent study revealed that the number of US children from ages three to 17 di uh, with diagnosed with anxiety rose 29% from 2016 to 2020. And those diagnosed with depression rose by 27%. It looks like we're in the middle of a crisis and it's not getting any better. We don't even know what, as we move on, it's 2023 and 2024, we're going to continue to see this crisis that we are currently in. And we see a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. Two questions for you. Why do you believe this is happening? And what are some immediate actions that parents can take? So one reason why it's happening is because we're more aware. So it's being talked about more. So people are like, hi, me too. I'm anxious too. Hi, hi, hi. So on one level, it's very good, right? That we are picking up, catching and treating the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Another reason, uh, and this is my personal reason, uh, is because kids are more disconnected because they're more on social media and these apps that allow them to be constantly stimulated so they never get in touch with their presence or their boredom or just relaxing. Yeah. They're constantly stimulated. And then they are living in this hyper realized, sexualized, idealistic, fake worlds. So of course, then you compare yourself and you're always looking lesser than because everyone's got something better. They're showing their fancy car or their fancy filters or their fancy homes. And you end up feeling lesser than because it's designed that way. So there's more of a comparison culture. 
but also, like I said uh, earlier, because we want our kids to be happy and all these apps are about dopamine highs and mm -hmm. the algorithms are designed to raise your dopamine, you're also crashing and then you want the next fix and you cannot tolerate low dopamine in your body anymore. But when we were growing up, we were like just bored all the time. We were just leading average existences, just roaming around in the garden. But that was good for us because we tolerated not having dopamine hitting us all the time. And yeah. then you get addicted to that. So talking about dopamine, this is a great transition into my next question, which is your generation. And, and I would also argue my generation as well has created all of these technology apps that allow for extreme convenience which brings up the issue of instant gratification. We can order food from our phones. We can order Uber from our phones. We can order groceries that literally get delivered within 15 minutes. I, I can order, actually it takes seven minutes, not even 15 minutes. We binge watch Netflix shows because they release an entire season at, uh, at once. It looks like everything around us is truly designed to now give us instant gratification. Now, Dr. Shafali, how do I teach my future child who's born into this new generation the concept of delayed gratification? Because to me, delayed gratification is so critically important. And I attribute a lot of the success that I personally had or as a company to the concept or just the, the, the idea of delayed gratification. How do parents instill that balance? Because now it's like 99% instant gratification. And I mean, delayed gratification is now out the window. Right. So I, I strongly recommend that parents do not give any social media apps, nothing to their kids till they're 14 or 15. Even YouTube needs to be supervised. Like YouTube is the new TV. So supervise your kids, be there with your kids. Do not leave them alone because it's not like a TV. Here it's constant streaming and constant entertainment. You can just keep clicking away. So when we used to watch TV, when, our, when we were young, the parent would say, okay, the show is over, done. But here there's no such thing as the show is over. So it's insatiable instant gratification. And that's not good for us because we are not pursuing anything. We're not waiting for anything. So nothing is amazing anymore, right? There's virtual reality. You can go to Rome sitting in your home. You can go to Turkey sitting in your home now. So it's taken away the real life connection so parents need to delay the gratification and delay it in their own lives and go back to one-on-one -on -one connection. And that's what this book teaches parents is the importance and value and how to of connecting directly one-on-one. -on -one. So parents are using social media as well and they're distracted yeah. and they're so happy because it's a babysitter. So the kids are missing out on connection, which is the cornerstone of conscious parenting. So Parents have to do the work, right? You cannot have kids and let them be raised by YouTube. You have to raise your kids, you, which means you have to be there present and have eye contact and spend the time and play with them and invest your energy on them. And parents are so distracted today that they themselves can't do that. They have no attention to do that. Yeah, parenting is another full-time job, yes? <laughs> it's the most full-time job. It's a full-life job. There's no expiration date. They are here for life. You cannot return them. That's it. It's a, it's a life sentence, you know? So we don't realize that it takes a lot of energy to do it right. Now, it doesn't take a lot of energy to do it crappily because you can just put them in front of the screen. Yeah. It takes a lot of energy to talk to them, to be available, to play games, to play with them, to imagine, to put them to sleep, to not use technology. It has to be real. It cannot be virtual. Yeah, let, let me be honest here. Just before we started our interview, like any other parent, my daughter gave me such an epic meltdown that I, I, I even wanted to cancel interview and said, Anayat, go just do yourself. So what helped me is your uh, vent method from your uh, new book. So could you please explain um, little bit about this event method and how and why it's so powerful. So your daughter was just being herself. Children don't know how to control their emotions because of three reasons. They don't have the skills. They don't have the experience. They don't have the self-worth to manage their emotions. Plus, 
she you know they have this radar they know when we're stressed they know when we're anxious they know we're trying to control them so we can get to the next job and they don't like that they don't want to be disconnected and we're stressed out and we don't realize how stressed out we are and how they pick up on that right couples will say i just sat down to have a romantic dinner and my kid starts to scream i just started to go on my meeting and the kid started because kids don't run on a timetable they need constant 24/7 awareness of their needs doesn't mean you have to meet their needs but they have needs so in that moment as a parent you have to find the compassion for them you have to find the way to empathize with them and you have to find a way to calm them down and part of that is to be regulated you have to be regulated and sometimes you may have to cancel the meeting and that's okay too uh parenthood is so difficult so challenging especially as we're trying to work at home we're trying to go to the gym we're trying to earn money now both parents want to do everything right so yeah. then there's then you cannot have children because then it's going to be impossible who's going to take care of the kids so we don't live in a community we don't live with our grandparents so it's all on us but we're also trying to be two earning members of the family so it's a lot of pressure on us parents uh, so so parents have to be perfect negotiators i see so your next book should be about how to be a perfect negotiator with your kids <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but just just to understand that ki- kids are kids kids are meant to fall apart they're not being bad kids they're not being difficult kids that's just their nature because they cannot they don't have the skills their brain is not yet developed they don't have the life experience enough practice and they may be going through a hard emotional time so they don't work on a timetable they don't work on our timetable so he- here at argo prep uh, we create and publish kindergarten to 8th grade materials for teachers to use in their classrooms uh, to boost student scores and confidence we sent out an email a couple of days ago to ask some of our teachers and parents to ask you questions we don't have anywhere near the time to ask any of these questions but what is very interesting was i saw many many repeated questions so i'm going to call it out even though you already answered it question and this is a famous question probably one of the most googled question here is at what age should i allow or give my child a smartphone and you stated at the very minimum 13 or 14 years old is that correct at the very minimum you can give them a phone and you can watch youtube or play games with them supervised like we did the tv right in the center of the house no privacy no isolation everybody watches or at least you're passing in and out why do i say that because it's so addictive and so isolating your kid will disappear into the phone the phone will eat your kid up you'll never see your kid again and it happened to me but my kid was already 13 and she had a whole childhood without smartphones so you need a kid who starts a smartphone and app usage at 14 is very different than a kid who starts at 8 yeah so and 14 is also young so oh. i'm just saying that because i know by then the kid will beat the parent up and lock them in the basement so i'm like give give it give it to them if you want to live but at least till then it's very easy to do when you're at a home school but if you're doing public schooling or private schooling when any other kid have phones and your child doesn't this is going to be crazy you have to again explain to your child why this why that yes and you have to think of it or i think of it as a loaded gun yeah i'm not going to give you a loaded gun it doesn't matter if everybody has it you cannot your brain cannot handle it you could go into the dark side you could lose yourself it's too dangerous when you realize how dangerous it is for developing minds i'm not saying it's dangerous in and of itself it just is not healthy for young minds to be prey to algorithms that are designed to create an addiction yeah So I I And every social media app company says that they are algorithms. I I love this conversation because I did not get my first smartphone till I was 18 years old. In fact, I never even had a phone till 18 years old. I had so many arguments with my mom. She was adamant, she never caved in. I did not get a phone until 18. And now in hindsight, now I really am thankful 
to my mom. When we had the computer to do all the computer work, she positioned it so there was no privacy. So everyone can watch that screen. So it's, you know, I cannot just isolate myself and enter and immerse myself and just go searching anything that I want. Did I like it at that time? Of course not. Uh, but now I'm forever grateful for those things because I really, really agree with you 100%. I think at the minimum, you know, the, the, the longer you can delay it, the better off you are. And right now, especially now where we have TikTok and all of these things that give us constant dopamine hits, this is a very scary situation. So after 13 to 16, you need to have like a contract. Like I need to know your password. I can go into your phone anytime. Mm. It needs to be only between these hours. We all keep it outside the, the room. I never let my daughter charge her phone till she was 16 in her room. She mm. had to charge it outside. So by 10 o'clock, it comes out. It can only be given to you after homework. So you put in all these boundaries and these walls that they have to climb over and then they get the phone. So as a parent, you have to be careful, but it is a, a devouring addiction in our world today. And parents need to prepare from a young age. I wish I had prepared better. I didn't know because I was an older generation. So you can create a family policy right from the start. Start telling your young kid, this is our policy. So you can blame the policy, right? But if you've already given your kid the phone and they're under 13, you can take the phone back and you can create the boundaries because your kid will yell and scream because they are in drug withdrawal for, for maybe seven days. They will drive you crazy, but then they will stop. Right. And now, since and I know your daughter is now 20 years old. Did your daughter come yet to you, uh, come to you yet and say, thank you, mom, for, for, for locking my phone away and putting all these restrictions or not yet? Well, you know, she, we had no choice because the phone only came out really in a big way till she was when she was 13 or 14. So mm -hmm. I can't even act like I was so smart. <laughs> I just got a little lucky. Right. <laughs> But then till 16, I used to be on her case and she used to be really mad with me. So I think she's still too young to appreciate. Right uh -huh. now, she's not in the mood in the mood to appreciate anything. You have to wait till they have kids. That's when yes. you're going to get appreciation. 1000% agree with you. But even before that, I five to seven years, even 10 years in, I promise you that your daughter will, I mean, you already know it yourself. She will be forever grateful and tell you, mom, you really, really did the right thing. <laughs> so I want to ask you one yes. last question, because if I don't ask it to you, I'm going to get a lot of my friends and family that are disappointed. So I want to talk about something that's very common in our culture. So South Asians experience high rates of mental health issues due to intergenerational trauma. South Asian culture emphasizes family loyalty, self-sacrifice and obedience. Our parents gave up nearly everything they knew and left everyone that they were familiar with to pursue a better life for us, their children. That decision and their unconscious parenting have had a colossal impact on many South Asians, including myself. So how do we heal from this and, and, and what can we do to improve our relationship with our parents? Well, you know, once you understand the culture that they were raised in, you can have compassion. My dad always tells me, you know, what did you expect from me? I was a product of my time, you know? And so there's nothing you can say because they are so conditioned because those cultures are so traditional that you have to forgive your parents. And anyway, being resentful is not going to change them. These South Asian parents are hardcore and they're not changing anytime soon. So you have to make a choice if you want to stay in resentment or you want to reparent yourself and break the pattern. Like I was the first pattern disruptor in my family and I got a divorce, which is unheard of in my culture. My, my poor parents must be still, you know, shuddering in their sleep, yeah. but they don't, they don't tell me they're very proud of me, but I'm sure they're, they're, they weren't happy about it because of yeah. what culture says, not because of what they believe. Yes. So in cultures like that, where the cultural pressure to look good and to be perfect is so much, that's really toxic for us kids because we feel obligated. We feel guilty. We feel like we owe our parents because they sacrifice, especially right. if they're immigrant parents. I'm, a first, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. So my daughter's first generation, I also try to guilt trip her 
all the time. I try it so hard. I'm like, oh, if you lived in India, you're so lucky. I didn't grow up like you. And if only you grew up like me. And she used to be like, mom, stop it. I didn't grow up in India. I'm, I'm much luckier than you. I get it. But like, don't make me feel guilty about what you did not have. And uh, so then I have to stand corrected. But I tried to guilt her too, like <laughs> my parents guilted me. But it's that immigrant mentality, right? I yeah. left my country for you. But it's too much pressure on our children. We left our country because we wanted to leave our country. Exactly. So exactly. we need to own that. And now when we're in America, we cannot put our old values here. Yeah. You know, that's, I don't know about you, Anayat, if you were raised as first generation, yeah. where your parents tried to be Bangladeshi, but you're in America, you know? Exactly. That's not fair. So when I came to America, I made the decision that I couldn't go all Indian now. I left India, so I'm here. I need to get with the tide and understand that my kid is in, in America now. So I had to let go of a lot of my traditional beliefs and let her be quote unquote American. And uh, that helped her to find herself in this place. I'm not in India, you're, you're, you're not in Bangladesh. So it's not fair to ask our children to be connected to the country when we left the country. Exactly. Right? Wow, 100%. Such beautiful insight. I'm going to go ahead and send this clip to my mom without a doubt. <laughs> but Dr. Shivali, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And I will tell you, I, I don't say this often. I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking with you. Uh, but your book, The Parenting Map, Step-by-Step -step Solution to Consciously Create the Ultimate Parent-Child Relationship is a must book have on every shelf. I know it's for parents, but I argue, and I, I, strong, I believe that this is a book for everyone because the set of principles you have applies to just everybody. It doesn't matter. The principles that you have are so beautiful that I think it belongs on every shelf at a home. So parents, teachers, anyone, I strongly, strongly urge you because this is some gr uh, groundbreaking material to read. And I had a really great time reading it. Thank you so much. I hope everyone grabs a copy of the parenting map and spreads it with their communities because it is about changing our future.